Good morning, everyone. Tim Nyland here. Today is Wednesday, March 24th, and this is our weekly strategy call for Zach's Professional Services. Each week, we focus in on what's moving the market. If you have a topic you'd like me to explore in a future video, please leave a comment below. You can check out previous strategy calls on our channel, and you'll also find many more videos on investing and making the most of Zach's Pro platforms. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button below to make sure you never miss any of our future calls. Today, we're going to explore growth stock valuation and specifically the proper way to do analysis in this rising interest rate environment. And this particular webinar is going to be an extension, if you will, a part two of last week's webinar. And I've got the webinar itself highlighted in red here with a, with a, with a box uh, to show you where it's located on the actual YouTube channel. It's Will Rising Inflation Sink Tech Stocks? So if you haven't seen that, please watch the Will Rising Inflation Sink Tech Stocks first. We go through a bunch of different charts uh, showing the inflationary risk and what all of the investors are concerned about, both from the buy side equity market as well as the credit market. And then we actually dive into individual stock analysis. The, the intention of today's webinar, again, is, is not to recommend a buy or sell of any of these stocks that we're going to talk about today, but rather to teach you to think differently in terms of how we're going to look at growth stock valuations going forward in this rising interest rate environment. And again, this is all being, being caused by this, this perceived inflationary threat. So this is a macro level equity valuation strategy session and what i'm trying to do is provide a framework for everyone to better understand how to quantify growth stock valuations during these periods of inflationary threat um, we're going to look at paypal today pinduo duo square zoom marriott and mercado libre as examples of stocks with high relative valuations okay and it doesn't mean that there's anything fundamentally wrong with these stocks. I'm just using these companies as examples of the macro level analysis that everyone should be doing to more or less determine the feasibility of names such as these uh, in your portfolio. So again, these are simply examples. I'm not recommending to buy or sell any of these names. We're, we're just doing some exploration here, okay? So during last week's webinar, I spoke of the mega cap tech group in terms of the Zach's earning certain tilt portfolio. And again, keep in mind that this group is Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And we compositized this group in the Zach's research system to represent it as one stock. And up on the screen here, you can see the price to year forward earnings chart relative to the S&P 500. And you can see that this group is sitting comfortably below minus one standard deviation uh, in terms of its PEF 12M. So if you just visually draw a line here, um, you can see that relative to the S&P 500, these six mega cap names uh, have not been this cheap literally since 2012, okay? So again, no concerns regarding the, the valuations of that mega cap group. Same thing with this, with this mega cap tech group relative to the triple Qs. Um, if you look at this group sitting comfortably below one standard deviation, uh, haven't been this cheap again since 2012. The idea here is that if these six names, which the bulk of them obviously dominate the triple Qs, um, represent minus one standard deviation of that forward multiple valuation relative to the triple Qs, that must mean that we've got a lot of very expensive stocks in the triple Qs. And that's what we're going to explore today. And um, so to do this, we're going to just do a quick recap on PayPal. And this is going to be the last time you'll actually see the PE chart of the earning certain tilt portfolio or that high beta tech group plotted. So just kind of burn this this PE multiple contraction in your head for the rest of the webinar. And you'll see I'm going to be speaking about this decoupling point that happened at the end of September when mega cap tech uh, more or less turned flat or, or, or stopped appreciating in value and actually started this, this PE multiple contraction. And then we had just a lot of tech names continue to expand their valuation 
to the point where now PayPal is trading at roughly a 68 multiple versus the, the group of mega cap tech stocks only trading at about a 39.27. And remember from last week, we talked about the Kathy Wood art crypto and the retail speculation phenomenon driving a lot of these names just into, into mania level valuations. And so we're going to explore this a little bit further. Again, this is going to be the last time I actually show how overvalued these are um, uh, in terms of um, standard deviation units relative to this mega cap tech group. But you can see with PayPal here, we're well in excess of plus two standard deviations. Um, this is obviously taken place in the face of rising interest rates and in the face of a recovery. And the idea is, you know, is this PE multiple expansion for companies like PayPal warranted um, and is it sustainable? And these are some of the things that we need to look at. Okay. So again, we are going to do a lot of modeling today on how bad an inflationary sell-off could potentially get with some of these names. We're going to toggle between doing this for PE multiples uh, as well as EV to EBITDA multiples. And so if we look at PayPal and we look at its current level of PEF-12M relative to its median, and we can use PE for PayPal because over the last five years, we actually have positive earnings um, and, and, and a level of growth that would warrant um, uh, effective use of a PE ratio. And so if we look at PayPal's five-year median sitting at only 40, you can see that we're currently sitting at 68.48. Notice that this is a Zach's research system chart of a PEF-12M, and I have it set to the default, which is a line chart. In the next view, to turn on the modeling capability, all you need to do is click on this icon in the upper left. It switches the view to a bar chart, and you'll have an arrow tool that you can activate by clicking once and then just holding down the arrow button in your, on your keypad. And you can see that in order to theoretically model that PEF-12M decline to 40.28 roughly to get you to that five-year median number, um, PayPal would actually have to fall by 41%, so a model price of roughly 146 bucks. And you know, certainly, I would love to see you know PayPal at that level. That would be that would be a, a really interesting proposition for for such a great growth company. Right now, it's sitting at a price of 249 bucks. It's 52 week high is 309. Um, so you get the idea even after a decline to 250 uh, in order to bring it in alignment with its five year median PE, um, we would actually have to have another 40% decline. So let's go ahead and explore some additional names. Um, Pin Duo Duo, I literally went through the entire NASDAQ 100 and picked out some very similar um, the decoupling scenarios. In the case of Pinduo Duo, this, this company's been getting a ton of headlines. Um, and this is what you've got to be very, very careful of when, when paying attention to headlines and all of the hype uh, associated with companies like Pinduo Duo. Obviously, very exciting. Um, I believe this company is, is, is part of the Tencent family um in China and it's obviously a, a massive e-commerce play that's become very, very popular. The issue here is this valuation decoupling that we had along around the same time as Mega Cap Tech. You'll see that it's 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 basically um around that September time frame of twenty twenty. And um and you can see that um the red line here uh on March thirty first, there's some significance here in the next slide I'm gonna show it. On March 31st of 2020, prior to the COVID crisis, um, this stock was a $36 stock. And obviously with COVID, everybody under lockdown, the idea of you know, Chinese e-commerce with the population in China, uh, obviously appealing. But then once we had the vaccine announcements and we had the threat of inflation, Biden uh, and, and, and obviously the Democrats taking control of the House and Senate, um, still uh, increasing at this rate, this valuation decoupling. The real issue here for Pin Duo Duo is this profitability timetable pushback. So keep in mind on this last slide, right? Back on March 31st of 2020, the price was 36 bucks. And even in the face of the COVID lockdown and the growth of e-commerce, 
since that point, the estimates for FY1 and FY2 have done nothing but decline, okay? So where the forecast was 82 cents for F1 is now negative 96 cents. So that forecast is actually down by 217%. Same thing for F2, where that estimate was $1.81, it's now negative four cents, okay? So the idea here is that, you know, this, this represents great operating leverage at some point for Pinduo Duo. The question is at what cost and how far out on the duration timeline do you want to push this future earnings? Because keep in mind, as interest rates rise, right, Wall Street's dividend discounting machine is going to heavily penalize those stocks that are not profitable for years out because they get discounted back at a higher rate for a longer period of time. So this operating leverage is good at some point to drive revenue growth. But ultimately, these companies need to be able to stand on their own from an earnings perspective. And in the face of this type of, of price appreciation from literally $36 to a 52-week high of $212 in the face of declining EPS estimates is a red flag. So these are the types of things that you're going to want to look at when you see all the headlines and you see all the excitement and all the money pouring into names like this. Um, you know, know what you're investing in and know what you're paying for. Um, Pinduo Duo is obviously doing a lot of reinvesting in its business, which is great, but that's going to come at a cost in a rising interest rate environment. So um, the next slide is still regarding Pinduo Duo, but the idea here, since we've got negative earnings, right, and we've got a lot of the um, expenses that we actually would want to capitalize um, and, and compare to a company like Tesla, we would want to change the analysis from a PE ratio over to an enterprise value to EBITDA. So when we talk about all the reinvestment that's going on with Pinduo Duo, the use of an enterprise value um, calculation, the numerator of our ratio is going to allow us to compare the valuation to a Tesla much more effectively because it looks at total firm value, including debt. And then obviously with EBITDA F12M, we're looking at a forecast measure. And because it's before depreciation and amortization, we're actually capitalizing all of that reinvestment that's going on. So we're able to put Penduo Duo on an even playing field as a company like Tesla. And where you thought Tesla was expensive, you'll actually see that Pinduo Duo is actually trading at five times the valuation of Tesla. So I'm just using Tesla here um, as a benchmark because many people think that Tesla is expensive. Um, I can tell you that there are many, many other stocks that are way more expensive than Tesla uh, that have been driven by a lot of this hype. And, and that's what we're gonna flush out today. Um, so hopefully you find this, um, this very interesting. And you'll note that I've got clipping and capping rules um, all throughout the system in the Zach's research system. And that's why you don't see um, uh, the, the line above 100. We have a capping rule on the enterprise value to EBITDA above 100, and then obviously below zero. Uh, that's why the chart looks a little funny, but it's so that we can provide better scaling for the companies, um, I'm going to say, that are a little bit more legitimate in terms of valuation and show the granularity between zero and 100, which is where most companies tend to trade. So you're gonna see these charts here in the next few slides and, um, and I'll explain it again as we see it. So enough with Pinduo Duo, let's talk about another, uh, one of my favorite stocks actually, um, which is Square. And um, again, that similar valuation decoupling alongside PayPal, alongside Pinduo Duo, um, Square and PayPal decoupled for a very different reason. Um, they obviously have cash apps and coin wallets that um, allowed them to partake in some of this Bitcoin hype and excitement. Uh, but the idea is, you know, what is the sustainability? What is the supportability of these valuations? And um, if you look at the red line, again, this is the type of analysis and the questions that you need to ask yourself before um, old, owning, holding, buying, selling. You just have to understand the valuations associated with companies like Square. This company could have been bought for $70 any time prior to COVID. We've literally shot to a high of 283 bucks within the last 52 weeks. So I've got the red line here showing it at any time in the past three years, it could have been bought for 70 bucks. 
Um, obviously, Square's got a bank charter. Now they're doing commercial lending. They've got the cash app. They've got a lot of things cooking for itself. They're building their own ecosystem. But again, how much do you want to pay for this? And will valuations get cheaper as interest rates rise? Um, the idea is, and again, I can look at a PEF 12M for, for Square. We've got earnings. We can actually do it for Tesla. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you. It's not the best Apple to Apple's comparison for a variety of reasons. Um, but I did want to show this chart to just show you if you thought Tesla was expensive, take a look at Square. Um, even after the price decline from 283 down to now 226, Square remains two and a half times overvalued relative to Tesla on a PEF 12M basis, right? Both of these companies have positive earnings, so we can do this. Okay. Probably a better way to do it um, is to look at enterprise value to EBITDA. All right. Again, looks at total firm value. And then obviously both of these companies being capital intensive, the use of EBITDA will allow us to more or less capitalize those expenditures by excluding depreciation and amortization. And um, we look at this on an F12M basis. You can see that Square is, a, is trading an enterprise value to EBITDA of 131.59 and Tesla 57.08. So that's about a 2.3x overvaluation relative to Tesla. And again, I'm using Tesla because it's kind of a bellwether name that everyone thinks is expensive. And the idea here that I want to drive home for everyone is that if you thought Tesla was expensive, then I can show you a lot of other companies that are trading at much more excessive valuations than investors tend to just readily accept and write off versus question. And so the idea here is we want to know how bad a potential sell-off in Square could get with, you know, let's say that we have a couple hot inflation reads this summer and, you know, the NASDAQ takes a, a 20% nosedive, which could very well happen, okay? So I've got the five-year median enterprise value to EBITDA up here. Notice that I don't have an enterprise value charted on this chart any time in 2021. That's because this thing has been trading in excess of my capping rules for this whole time period. Um, so I've got a median of 61.87, currently trading at 31.59. And the idea is, you know, how bad could it potentially get? So if we hold the fundamentals constant, we have to hold the fundamentals constant, right, to be able to actually model a price decline. We can't assume that EBITDA is going to change and everything's going to be changing at the same time. So we're going to hold everything constant except for the price. So we're going to basically use that bar chart view of enterprise value to EBITDA grab the arrow tool and, and keep in mind that with, with Square, we're off the charts up here. So you literally have to hold down the arrow on your keyboard for probably 10 seconds to bring this EB to EBITDA down to its five-year median, about 61. And you'll see that we've still got to have about a 57% price decline to get it to its five-year median. Now, I'm not saying that's realistic. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Um, if we get a 20% sell-off in the NASDAQ, which, you know, anything is possible. You get a hot inflation, couple hot inflationary reads, interest rates spike, um, you know, the, the, the Qs and the NASDAQ are definitely going to take it on the chin. Uh, and these high-flying growth stocks are the ones that are going to get hit bad. And um, so just keep that in mind, right? So if I go back a couple slides, um, you know, is it unrealistic, and I'm going back a few slides here, to think that we would get down to, you know, 120, 150 bucks? I, you know, it's just probably realistic when you could have bought this thing for the prior three years at 70 bucks. Um, that's still 100% higher than it was uh, back at the start of 2020. So at any rate, um, keep in mind, that is uh, what we're looking at with Square. Uh, the next thing I want to explore is one that is dear to my heart because I watch the value rotation and and sometimes I watch it in absolute dismay and shock. And Marriott's valuations are are one of the, the things that I really keep a pulse on relative to a company like Zoom. And so um, what I want everyone to think about is this pairs trade, right? And there's a, there's a hundred of them or more. Zoom and Marriott are a pairs trade. I mean, can these high valuations coexist, right? Zoom says, you know, work from home is here to stay and they have a new business model and they're going to continue to grow. Well, I'm not seeing that growth baked into the forecasts. I see negative 8% coming off the COVID boom to 14% to 20%. I mean, it's, it's good growth, but I don't see it as hyper growth anymore. 
I don't see it as hyper growth to warrant a PE of, of 160 times on 2022 earnings and then um, 140 times on 2023 earnings, but I'm willing to look at this, okay? And the idea is Marriott and its valuations and, and the way investors are pricing Marriott, we're gonna look at the slides here in just a minute. It's more like, you know, work from home is not here to stay. Keep in mind that the hotel industry makes the bulk of their revenues um, from the business travel. I mean, that's their highest margin ticket. And so Marriott investors are betting that business travel is going to come back. And I'm sure a certain portion of it's going to come back, but it's probably likely not all going to come back. So this is a pairs trade. These valuations, in my opinion, can't coexist at the rate they're at right now. So there's going to have to be some give and take. And I think you're going to see some real tug of war here over the next couple of years between the likes of these types of names. Okay. So um, keep in mind the next slide here, we're looking at the growth rates, right? So we're, we're looking at Zoom investors paying 140 to 160 times forward earnings. And you can see those numbers right here. This is the price and earnings chart out of the research system. So on 2022 earnings estimate of $2.16, it's 160 times earnings is, is the valuation. Um, that is a massive PE multiple when you consider that at best, we're looking at 20% growth out to 2024. Um, the next slide, I can get a company like Facebook, uh, I can get a solid 20% growth, at least for FY2, out of Facebook, and the forward PE is only 25 times on average, right? On that 2022 number, it's 21. On 2023, it's trading at about an, an 18 multiple. But the idea is, you know, with roughly 20% growth, would you rather own a company like Facebook with a proven track record? Um, you know there's gonna be demand for that, especially with small businesses reopening, trading at only a multiple of 25 times, or are you gonna take a gamble on this pairs trade between Zoom and Marriott and pay 160 times or 140 times for the same 20% EPS growth uh, in, in FY3, okay? So again, this is the way I want you to start thinking about these types of valuations. If you're going to be a growth investor, you've got to look at growth at reasonable valuations. And there are trade-offs. Okay, These are alternatives. These are investment alternatives that we're looking at. Okay. Um, the next alternative here for us, instead of Zoom, if, if we don't like Facebook, we could get conservative and we could pay 20 times for rock-solid growth with Fiserv. And keep in mind, Facebook is obviously one of our bellwether um, macro tilt for the earnings certain family of portfolios. And Fiserv is one of our bellwether earnings certain portfolio members literally across the board. It's in the ECP core 75 and it's in the Admiral 30. Um, and you, if you look at the chart, the price and earnings, you'll see why that orange line is your earnings line and it's virtually unscathed. It doesn't matter um, if there's a COVID pandemic, it doesn't matter if there's a recession or two and nothing matters to Fiserv. It just continues to grow. And so if you're looking for roughly 20% growth and you're more conservative, why would you pay 160 times for Zoom when you can just lock into a company like Fiserv, get that same 15 to 20% um, and, and pay a much less PE multiple? So again, along the same lines of this Paris trade between Zoom and Marriott, looking at alternatives, um, to avoid that tug of war in terms of valuation that's likely to play out. So let's take a look at Marriott and some of the things that we need to consider when looking at a name like Marriott. And again, I'm, I'm saying that Marriott investors are at odds with Zoom investors because if you look at the valuation here for Marriott, I want you to see that right now, and this is why I chose Marriott, we are literally at pre-COVID pricing, okay? And earnings are nowhere to be found. Not even in three years is the sell side even forecasting earnings to be where they were pre-COVID. So now that we're trading at pre-COVID levels, what, what type of message are, are we to you know, walk away from here? So again, when we're looking at alternatives between Zoom, Marriott, the value rotation. I see research every day published that people are saying, you know, value stocks are the new growth trade. Um, I want you to be careful. I want you to challenge what you're reading. I want you to challenge the press. I want you to have 
some system in place where you can say, you know what, I'm going to take a pass on that. Or, you know what, he's right. That's something I'm interested in. Clearly, Marriott, um, you, we are going to have, obviously, a, a vacation and travel boom. But if you're buying Marriott up here, you're betting that business travel is going to resume uh, 100% or even more and quickly. And clearly, the sell side is not in that camp. So just be advised. Those are the questions you've got to ask yourself. Okay, next one, company I love, Mercado Libre, um, probably the, the, the purest uh, uh, monopoly I've seen in, in years um, down in South America, Latin America, um, basically the Amazon of, of Latin America. But these guys also are in that similar valuation decoupling phase. And this was not an issue um, you know, prior to this inflationary scare, this 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 rising interest rate environment, right? Last year, um, obviously, a lot of talk around Mercado Libre. Uh, we were in a totally different environment. Everything was momentum driven. We had um, extremely low rates um, and and really no threat of inflation on the uh, on, on the time horizon. And we also didn't realize how quickly the uh, the vaccines would be distributed and their efficacy as well. So what's going on with Mercado Libre? Let's talk about this. This is a little bit different. We've got the same valuation decoupling from mega cap tech. You'll see that the same green line right there in September. Um, that's not necessarily the issue. With, with Mercado Libre, the issue here is we had a massive December 2020 earnings miss. And um, it was a huge miss. Uh, we were literally forecasting 39 cents. And they reported a negative dollar two, so it was a surprise of you know in excess over over a dollar. And you know we've got all the surprise charts. These are available in advisor tools as well as the research system. And I've just got some of the areas here highlighted so that you can see um, you know the magnitude of this. But but what I want everybody to see um, from an investor perspective, when you're when you're investing in these in these high flying growth names. When you get a trend in earnings surprise, it's really important to look at it because what it's telling you is it's telling you management's ability to effectively guide the sell side analysts, right? So when you see a couple really, really off earnings surprises like this negative 98 cents and a dollar one, we could probably give them a pass a couple times. But when this becomes a trend and now we miss by a negative $1.41, um, and, and we're not giving proper guidance on this type of thing, even if we are reinvesting for the, you know, for the long haul, um, these types of shocks to the system can really, um, really weigh on investor sentiment and, and confidence. And I think that we're seeing that now with Mercado Libre. Um, the interesting thing with Mercado Libre is it was kind of a one-two punch to investors. Um, and this literally just happened this month. I believe they reported around March 1st. And what I want everybody to see is that we did get a little bit of an estimate decline here um, for F1. This is the December 2021 uh, quarter on 228. So we had fallen all the way from 446 to 359. I wasn't necessarily concerned at this point. When I got concerned about Mercado Libre was when the quarter was reported a massive miss, and then they turn around and guided even lower. So you'll see estimates actually are now at 206. And so that F1 2021 was revised down another 43% from the 359. So not only did we miss the December quarter, but then estimates fell for F1 another 43% to 206. So obviously Mercado Libre is reinvesting in their business. It goes back to the same uh, concept as Pinduo Duo. It's operating leverage, right? It's good. It's great. Mercado Libre is 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 a massive growth stock. It's one of the one of the highest growth names in in you know in the market. But this operating leverage is going to come at at a cost in terms of valuation, especially in a in a rapidly rising in, inflationary environment. So that's the risk. I mean, if we're going to have this the, you know these headline you know inflationary reads that are hot come in, uh, Mercado Libre could suffer. So these are the things that I want you to think about when you're looking at these types of names. And I'm going to go back to, again, with Mercado Libre, because they've got negative earnings still, um, it's better to look at enterprise value to EBITDA, and they're reinvesting in that business. So we need to basically capitalize those expenditures by looking at an EBITDA measure versus an earnings measure. 
And uh, we'll look at it relative to Tesla. I did a, uh, I did a webinar um, late last year on Mercado Libre being the next Tesla. So let's, let's compare the valuations again. Mercado Libre is trading at a 190 enterprise value to EBITDA. Tesla is a 58.37. And that's even after a 52-week price decline from 2000. We were up over $2,000 on Mercado Libre um, towards the beginning of the year, end of last year. Now we're at 14.75. I think we've probably fallen even a little bit lower. Um, but that's 3.2 times overvalued relative to Tesla on an EV to EBITDA basis. Again, based on the growth that we were looking at for F1 late last year, um, into the fall of last year, that valuation was probably warranted. But now we have to question where we're at in this market cycle with this threat of potential inflation, rising interest rate environment. At the same time, Mercado Libre missing on that fourth quarter estimate and then um, continuing to then experience consensus estimate revisions down um, another 43% from 359 when they reported on, I believe it was March 1st, down to now 206. So that's uh, the, the issue with Mercado Libre. So from where we're sitting, we need to figure out how, how bad a sell-off could get if we get some hot inflation reads and the NASDAQ were to um, fall into correction territory. And so we look at that bar chart again with Mercado Libre. Five-year median EV to EBITDA is roughly 100. Um, it's, it's been an expensive stock. It's always been an expensive stock. What's the likelihood of this thing reverting back to its five-year median EV to EBITDA if we get into some sort of inflationary crisis or, or a few hot reads that scare the market? It could happen. So we need to, we need to value this. We need to understand it. So the current EV to EBITDA is 190. And again, I'm going to switch it over to that bar chart view, and I'm going to drag the, with the arrow to me, use my keyboard, and bring that, bring that EV to EBITDA multiple down to 100. And you can see that, that uh, Mercado Libre would have to fall um, 47% down to 776. Um, keep in mind that I believe it was just back in September, August, September of last year, Mercado Libre was trading at you know, high eights, 900 level. Is it possible that Mercado Libre could fall down to 776? I, you know, it, it, it could with, with a massive NASDAQ correction, it could. Keep in mind that the Zacks rank here is also strong sell right now. It's obviously picking up on, on all those anima, analyst revisions down. Um, the idea here is that Mercado Libre is building something great. They're in the process of building really good operating leverage. But again, that's gonna come at a cost at a higher inflationary environment, higher interest rate environment. So these are things we gotta keep in mind. So some takeaways today. Um, keep in mind, again, I'm not making any recommendations here. These high beta growth stocks may very well fit within your portfolio, right, based on your risk return profile. Just be aware of the downside risk these names face uh, with the threat of these inflationary scares expected in the future. We don't know if it's going to happen, but we need to be prepared and we need to understand what the valuations look like, what we're getting into. Um, use this relative framework that I've presented to rationalize these valuations, right? Know the performance relative to others with a good history of growth is the key. I'm using Tesla um, as, as my benchmark of a high flyer. Um, I've also used the mega cap tech names. You, you've seen it. Don't fall in love with the company. Remember, we're in a, we were in a momentum-driven growth market for the bulk of 2021. We are now in a very different environment. We've got expensive, and I, again, I'm speaking relatively here, we've got expensive value and growth stocks that are dominating the headlines. And it's really, it, it can be really misleading. It, so it's very helpful to be able to cross-check what you're seeing and reading. Um, I spoke earlier here of point number four. Um, these equity valuation models using discounted future cash flows, um, they discount earnings back to present, right? Earnings and cash flows. High beta names with positive EPS later in the future represent longer duration risk, right? So when we see the, the companies that are building that operating leverage, they're pushing back their earnings, they're reinvesting in their business, it's great, um, but it's gonna come potentially at a cost. These names are more likely to correct violently during an inflationary scare. The mega cap technology names, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Adobe, these guys are well suited in this environment at current valuations. They have a low duration, relatively speaking, unwavering growth and solid balance sheets. Um, relatively speaking, growth at a reasonable price, I've alluded to this, 
it is a preferred strategy for growth investors during this point in the cycle. That's more or less what I've been talking about today. Um, remember that the earnings certain portfolio strategy has many GARP characteristics, especially when you consider where the ECP strategy is falls right now relative to the S&P 500 in terms of valuation, coupled with the fact that it has superior stable EPS growth and superior profitability and balance sheet characteristics. And if anyone has any questions about that, specifically that point number seven, reach out to me. I've got all the charts, more than happy to um, to go through that. And I'll probably do a, a, a valuation or a, a strategy session on that here in the very near future. So um, that's about it for this week. Thank you all for attending. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe for future videos. If you have any questions or requests, please leave a comment below or feel free to email me at tnyland at zax.com. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn and my Twitter handle is at Tim Nyland. If you're interested in getting started with advisor tools or the research system, or you're looking to upgrade your current subscription, please contact our world-class supported advisor tools at zax.com and zrs at zax.com. And again, I make this slide deck available to anyone who requests it. You can email me directly, or you can email any of these email addresses you see on the screen. I'm more than happy to share this out with anyone who would like to see it. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.